applications. What logics are involved in crafting spaces for digital performance interaction? Leading us into this conversation is Ian Garrett from Toaster Lab fame. Hello, everyone. Give me just one second. I realize I have our live stream on, too, and I want to make sure that I have turned that off. The monitor. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm gonna. Uh, we have a, a really great panel here, um, especially in terms of um, actually coming up and figuring out what exactly we're even talking about here. Well, that's what we've been talking about backstage. So I'm gonna do uh, brief introductions. I'm gonna bring everybody out. Um, they're waiting in the wings. I love that we have this ability to um, completely <laughs> construct optionally our uh, our desire to um, gather into a theatrical space. But we'll talk a little bit more about the things that we can and cannot do in a moment. So first I'm gonna invite Beth Cates to the stage. Beth is an award-winning lighting set projection and mixed reality designer. Uh, she started in rock and roll at 14 uh, and uh, has been doing lots of work associated with this, part of, part of steering this uh, event going on. You may have been with her workshop right before this as well. Um, she was most recently the virtual world lighting designer and virtual stage lighting designer for uh, Double Eye Studios VR Theater Performance Finding Pandora X at the Venice Film Festival, a theater piece in the film festival, uh, which won Best Immersive VR uh, Experience, and just recently completed her MFA at uh, UCalgary, uh, where she's been doing research uh, between drama and computer science, uh, looking at VR, AR, and live performance. She also sits uh, on the uh, advisory board for Toaster Lab, uh, which she chairs. Um, next, I'm going to bring out Frank Lucas, uh, a mixed reality designer uh, who has a company. Uh, it's called Restos Reality yeah, Interactive. Uh, his background is in quality assurance, but now he works with companies to consult, design, prototype, and ultimately bring to fruition mixed reality applications and experiences. And we are talking a lot about how he's been doing that with HoloLens recently um, in the uh, uh, outside of this space. Again, weird that we're talking about being outside of places uh, for consumers, enterprise, and manufacturing. Has a lot of experience also um, within the video game space. And then I'll also invite uh, uh, David Rockaby, uh, who uh, is, uh, has, a, I could go on, uh, right now serves as a uh, lecturer and associate director at the BMO Lab at the University of Toronto. Uh, he's been creating interactive sound and video installations uh, since 1982. Uh, his early work, very nervous, and is acknowledged as a pioneering work of interactive art, uh, uh, translating physical gestures into real-time interactive sound environments, uh, which, uh, without getting too far into um, just everybody's accolades, we because of the limits to the time that we have here. Thanks everybody for joining me on stage. Um, I want to use that sort of as a bridge because we were talking about uh, backstage, again, weird to think about this metaphor in this virtual space, going backstage about how that is a mixed reality practice, um, like before it was co-opted uh, by Microsoft as a trademarkable property of what mixed reality is. Uh, and getting to this question of what is, what are we talking about when we're talking about designing spatially? And we have like a preconceived notion. Well, we all share a bit of a notion of it in like, if we've been at this conference for a few days of, of a spatial practice, because here we are in a virtual space. Uh, but I'm going to turn it to our panel, making sure that you each have the megaphone um, uh, to ask you what when you're asked, uh, when you're asked, uh, when you when you were asked to be on a panel for a uh, spatial design, um, what did you imagine that actually meant? So I'm going to I'm going to make sure that you're all on air, and that you've got the megaphone as you're up here on stage. Uh, David, I might start with you first because I, I I shortchanged a bit of your uh, uh, your introduction there. <laughs> Um, and you're like, you've got like just a storied bio there, but you've been working in different aspects of the space for a long time and now are uh, directing or are associate director of the BMO lab, which is looking at this in a, in a different way as well. Like, what are the different ways of defining virtual of spatial designs that you've that you've uh, let? 
Yeah, so <clears throat> I guess the strangest thing for me is that I started doing something that I guess you could call augmented reality with my interactive sound installations like Very Nervous System. And in that case, what it was is not so much spatial design as redefining new behaviors within a given space. So I was often going to a gallery and I'd have to put it in a gallery or I'd pose it on a street corner by pointing a camera out a window or something. So I was often interposing a new behavior on existing space or something like that. And in that case, the spatial design was actually very pragmatic. Um, and so not even worth going into where you point your camera, how you orient the space, except to consider questions of, of actually how people move around. And that became very much, I, I guess, a question that's relevant also in this context. But how do you design an installation, right? I would have defined myself as an installation artist in the 80s and 90s. And there, you're an artist who's not working with a sculpture or an image on the wall or a sound, but you're working with the space and redesigning the space to mean something. So I spent a lot of time thinking about what it means when you walk into a space, what you confront, what barriers are there, what do you see and what don't do you see as you enter and as you turn a corner, what's revealed, and how does the order that things are revealed speak to you? So there's kind of a architecture through which meaning was generated. And so even just us coming back from behind there has a certain story to it, that architecture, and that our movement through space and the way it, it guides us through space says something about that. But I would think about that in the context of the installations I was doing. Um, since then, I've done other things uh, involving space using things like the Connect or the Azure Connect now to construct, um, to design uh, behaviors in space sculpturally. So mm -hmm. where I can use my phone app uh, walk into the middle of the space, choose a sound, for example, and then press a button and say, that sound will be here. And then choose another sound and say, okay, that one's going to be on the underside of that sound. And then we're going to build, so I would build a three-dimensional volume of sounds in, say, a 60 by 30 foot space that you explore reaching through it. So that's, that's a very different spatial design sense, which I'm actually changing the character or behavior of things in the space and designing it, again, from a sculptural or installation perspective. Um, and then it's really, then space becomes story in a funny way, like how you encounter sound, what sounds you encounter, what order changes the narrative you're spinning for yourself as you encounter them. So then it's kind of like sound possibilities as, as story space that you can move through. Um, so those are some examples of ways I've thought about spatial design. Yeah. I think I may come to you with the, the same question, coming at this from a very different practice, especially in terms of of using like HoloLens and AR and how those are blending two different types of spatialization. Like what what how do you approach spatial design? How are you thinking about that when you when you come into those conversations? Yeah, so it's 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 actually really interesting because you know when you're here in virtual reality, you're really only dealing with the digital, right? You can sort of make anything any size and kind of like you kind of have a little bit more um, uh, you have a little bit more freedom with what you're allowed to create when you're in augmented reality with something like the hololens if you don't know it's it's kind of like this VR headset but you can still see the real world um, so you're designing on top of the existing reality which makes it a little bit more uh, maybe difficult because you can't just go crazy um, because you still have to conform to the sort of physics of the real world um, but I think a lot of a lot of the sort of principles you get with normal sort of set design, and for me as a video game designer, my background is in a level design. Um, so you're kind of having those same thoughts in your head. You, you know, you're thinking, okay, well, what am I going to have my audience looking at at any given time, and what are they allowed to touch, and what are they allowed to kind of, you know, can they do anything, or are they just an observer in this world? And a lot of times they are. Um, but my my sort of the uh, most interesting experience was I got to um, I got to help with a, a theater production, and it was it wasn't really a theater production. It was more like an advertisement, but we got you know real actors. We had people come in for auditions and wear the Hololens and see how comfortable they looked with it, which was really interesting. But the most interesting part was um, when they put the thing on and we were doing the shoots. They weren't just acting out, you know oh, this is what it looks like, and this is what it feels like. They were actually using the technology um, that's on their head to, you know, really sort of interact with what we were filming. 
So you look at a lot of old movies. You know, I'm a big fan of like Mortal Kombat. I don't know if any of you know Mortal Kombat. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you watch the like behind the scenes and you see, you know, Liu Kang, he's like fighting with this lizard that's not really there, right? And he has to pretend like it's real. Um, but here we got to see these actors who, who have done sort of things like that before, but they were actually doing it. You know, it wasn't like in my head and in their head. And we were, you know, it was real to them, to us, to everyone. Um, so that's like another interesting thing. Um, but at the same time, if you're doing something like a, a installation or a demonstration you can't give too much so one of the sort of biggest takeaways for me was giving people things to play with when you're trying to tell them something they're not going to mm -hmm. listen to you <laughs> right <laughs> so that was like one of my early learnings making all these prototypes in 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 an augmented reality hololens headset because people are going to want to reach out and touch things right so um yeah, you got to find that balance. Um, yeah, that's a, that's actually a really interesting way to segue into asking this question of Beth because you just came from a workshop in AltSpace where people were using the tools for devising performance spaces, like doing the uh, like customizing scenography within unlimited space as long as it's available in AltSpace as well. Um, how did that a how did that go and b <laughs> um how does that relate to like the way that you approach thinking about spatial design and sonography okay that's a great question um i think it went really well um there, it was it was really fantastic to see what was created by more or less new adopters to the technology, um, and with very we did put some pretty significant limitations on. But to watch the inventiveness with manipulating space, and we had everything like there was everything from live piano to curtains that opened right without without there being animations available to anyone. It was using mm -hmm. the tools. Um, to create the space using the tools that existed to create space. Um, we had a like a promenade piece. Um, so people really um, got inventive with the, all the dimensions of the space. So both playing with scale and, um, and the lack of physics. And so this is so in terms of approaching spatial design, it becomes really interesting as we hybridize these worlds. And and um, uh, I would say that since I started working in VR, I, I wonder how much my approach has changed because because we're liberated from physics here. We can do anything. Um, the things that have become really interesting for me, too, like Frank mentions, like um, the gamification of space is something that is um, requires an enormous amount of consideration, and and has started to factor into approaches in in spatial design, like how. How do you introduce things that you do want interaction with in telling the story of the space without it getting in the way of the story of the space? Um, and so spatial design starts to become this like super multi-layered, a web-like creature mm -hmm. that is far beyond the flats and drops and uh, trucks of, of yesteryear. Um, which, which actually, for me, the the work in VR has opened up my brain a little bit in terms of how to approach those an more analog pieces, um, mm. uh, because there are no limits here, and so. Um, I haven't had trouble encompassing that, like including that in my thinking. The like I haven't had trouble letting go of the analog way, but trying to figure out what can we bring from what we're learning in in VR into the analog space becomes really interesting. Um, and so, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh no, no, no! Finish your thought because I have I have um, a follow up. Okay, I was just thinking too about what I witnessed of of the groups um, only, and so there, for people who weren't there, there were four 
uh, what I called sonographers or sonographers or terraformers um, who had the ability to construct space and then they were working with other people in the group and there was a wide range of, of new adopters, old adopters, actors, writers, whatevers, people who were, who were makers. Um, and, uh, and, the, and to watch the, the really um, incredible liberation of exploration of physical space and then the placement of the sonic space and there was actors distributed like it was really it was really inspiring um and it was really wonderful to see so yeah um and on the subject of limitations i think that my my the question that i that i have to follow up with is that i had a i had well for the second time both times which have been as a result um uh of this conference uh, I have uh, I have run into somebody um, earlier before this session as I was um, as I had helped people get into the um, get into your workshop uh, Beth I had um, sorry I got a pop-up uh, that's one of the awesome things about this space <laughs> uh, totally. that there is a message floating in front of me um, <laughs> Um, so I, I'm gonna let that happen, and I'm gonna ask this question. So I ran into Ring and got introduced on the main concourse, and uh, like last week, as I was moving through the central room before coming to the presentation rooms, I uh, ran into Liam from uh, from Single Fed, and I ran into people. And every other interaction that I've had since March 13th has been pre-planned um, because of the limitations that we have. In what you're saying, in terms of thinking about the the way that limitations have been opened up, I, I, I would open it up to every uh, to everybody here who's been experiencing these like limitations of the way that we interact with people, and how might that have changed your idea of thinking about, it in whichever way that you're coming into thinking about space and programming space and the storytelling that goes along the space, how has that changed in this time when we don't really get out much? I think this is uh, this is something that um, so there's a, a guy named Kent By and he's um, a VR philosopher for lack of a better word. He runs this great podcast uh, called Voices of VR, and he and I have talked about this idea of, and he's talked a lot about it on his own too. But this idea of that that um, the hallway conversation, right? Like we've all been to conferences before and you do that bumping into, to people. And, and so in, in these kinds of social spaces, find thinking about the traffic pattern, right? Cause as we're porting, we're just leap making these leaps from one place to another. What can we do then with that spawn point that allows that, that kind of crossover? How do mm -hmm. we, how do we guide, um, how do we guide people through without having to take their hand and go, okay, follow me? Um, how do you create those those spaces where the hallway conversations happen in a place where you can just zap around? It's it's really interesting. And, and having been at, at several VR conferences in VR now, um, it's not being thought about. Um, mm. we're, we're, there, there are very traditional approaches to creation of space and like actually may, remaking conference rooms, like, <laughs> which is, <laughs> yeah. which is not exciting. <laughs> um, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was something that, that really strikes me as, as we're talking about the absence of limitations. We keep imposing familiar limitations on ourselves and for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. it's familiar, et cetera. But I find myself wondering uh, you know, there's a, there's a long history in computational arts of be before you had NVIDIA and AMD rendering engines, when it was all software to generate sense of space, it was relatively easy for an artist or an artist and a programmer to come up with alternative representations of space. And right now, mm -hmm. conventional Brunelleschi perspective, two-point or three-point perspective is pretty much baked in. And in fact, if you look at medieval art, the artist had the opportunity to say, well, this person's really important, so I'll make them five times as big, and I'm going to collapse this space because it's not important. And so I wonder if there are ways for us to explore, given the fact that we have the freedom, can we come up with ways to, you know, like maybe maybe social space should bend around me like like 
gravity, like we, we, we have gravitational waves around us. And so when I spawn somewhere, initially everyone's far away from me because I've created a kind of distortion and then people come to me slowly. Like maybe there's, you know, how can we uh, marry the potentials that this does, which opens everything up to the fact that we still want to be able to have those encounters. So being able to bump into someone is important, but, but you know, I was struck actually the other day, the first time I was in this room, and I had to keep maneuvering to be able to see what was going on. I'm going, why do I have to maneuver in a space where anything's possible? <laughs> why, or, or is that good? Like, or is that actually a good thing? Is it, you know, it was a funny mixture of experiences. And so I, I, I you know, um, there are artists that, for example, went as far as rendering inverse perspective, where everything is smaller the closer it is to you. <laughs> it's pretty hard to deal with, but it's pretty astounding <laughs> to, to just challenge the sort of middle of the road reality that we tend to reproduce in these spaces. You know, to, to add to that really quickly, um, so I've been in VR a long, long time, right? Since the Oculus, I'm sure you've been in longer, but the Oculus days, not the <laughs> Oculus. But when I first started getting into it, I used to, like, I'm a gamer, right? So I like to try all the new sort of experiences. And one of the ones that I tried was uh, a massively multiplayer online RPG. And when I first booted it up and went into the world, everyone has an open mic and everybody's everywhere and you can hear everyone at almost all times. And I hated it. <laughs> You know, I was like, oh, I don't want to hear these people. It's it, it's too much, right? Like, but as the world changed and, um, you know, the, the social interactions became less and less, I actually find myself gravitating more and more to those experiences. Um, and of course, they've really improved it a lot with things like, you know, the, the, uh, the bubble and things like that. So you don't have to get sort of that sensory overload. Um, but I just thought that was interesting, the way that my sort of mindset changed. Um, that's all yeah, it's it's interesting because there's a there's a, a Jacob Nidzvicki who's um, part of cohort uh, um, who, who will be is presenting it multiple times uh, throughout the conference. He and I were having a conversation about like what the idea with all the streaming, even just streaming performances, all of this is going to be online. Like we've uh, one of the things that we're missing is like the audience's ability to ruin a performance because <laughs> you don't have that open world like anybody could say something at any time sort of thing and you know that's one of the the conversations over the course of this this conference that's happened too is like do we use the mute everybody i think that the first opening like we're like yeah we're gonna mute everybody so that people could speak but then it's just like everybody's stuck it gets stuck in like a dead silence so that it's like well let's leave it open and 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 people will sort of like navigate that, that space I, i'm also really interested in this idea of it can be anything for the toast web presentation we did last week um like we just didn't want to do a powerpoint and we did not get so far and alt space does not let you get so far from reality that it's not like recognizable as a space that you can occupy but we decided to do the presentation a different way where we put it up as banners of 3d objects in space and led people around as opposed to like come see a, a screen like let's go into vr so you can watch me present virtually on a on a screen um which is like an interesting like you know we're very early in that um there's another thing that we were talking about backstage that i also wanted uh uh to bring up in terms of thinking about like ownership of space but we're gonna there's gonna be a conversation later in the conference about ownership of uh of like product or or, or ownership of the types of projects that you make but we started talking backstage like half of us are on uh, are on an Oculus. Um, half of us are not. Are on Vive Pros. And we were talking about it because, like, sometimes weird things happen with hands, and the tracking is sort of like calibrated to different things. Especially, um, you know, there's a couple of people that I've interacted with in this who are on like um, the, the the first Oculus Rift, which uses external trackers. It's very easy for a hand to wander away if it's not like if they're, they're calibrated or the occlusion is weird. Um, but we're also like. So those of us who are on an Oculus are on a Facebook platform and we're being tracked through space, right? Like we like for it to work, that literally has to happen. Like we can't participate on an Oculus without allowing Facebook to track our movement. And the Oculus too, which was announced like in various future headsets, they talk about like other like essentially bio information about our movement and the way that we interact with it which is meant to improve our experience but also like 
opens up this question of what's going to happen with that data. So I think that my question for that is, as we're thinking about like space, what do we think about uh, like the ownership of that space? It's something that's easier to and more obvious perhaps at times when we're in like carbon space, like we know who owns a building maybe, or when, you know, there's a clear definition between corporate or public or private land. Um, but now we're in this like weird place where we feel very free. We feel free to move around, but ultimately, you know, to make that happen, we have to give up some of that, like our movement through space and the ability to track the way that we move. Um, what are your thoughts on on that? And knowing that those who are, aside from the fact they're being tracked by everybody who's on an Oculus, those who are not on the <laughs> Oculus might have different thoughts about that and that you have a little bit, maybe you have a little bit more freedom to move. What do you think? The, the, uh, Florian Rotzer, a uh, German theorist, wrote um, way back at the early, in the early days of VR that um, the dream of sort of infinite interaction and infinite freedom in virtual space comes at precisely at the cost of infinite surveillance. You cannot separate the mm -hmm. two. And that's a profound, you know, and so there is uh, this extreme contrast between the, the freedom in theory that one has in this space but you, but to get that freedom in this not in this non in this spatial non space or whatever, you have to give away something uh, at the same time. So it's a, there's a sort of central paradox in most interactive technologies. The freedoms they open up carry with them these trade offs, and so questions about privacy, the whole battle between, you know. Uh, uh, tracking the value of tracking data as for for machine learning, for example, the value of tracking data for um, for the, for the commercial and sort of um, uh, selling of advertising, etc., versus the you know I guess it's there's a sort of an Apple Google model there of, of, mm -hmm. of privacy. These are I think these are really fundamentally important questions as you spend more and more time in these spaces, and um, it's really it's we have to become really aware I think of then the uh, the motivations the the initi the um, the motivate, the, yeah, the motivations that each of the, the the platforms and the operators of the platforms and the people building the software have, and consider the implications somehow. I mean, it's it's a real mess, really. We yeah. have to figure out. Frank is without asking you to violate any potential NDAs, knowing that you're working <laughs> in a more corporate space. Um, how how is this has has this factored into some of the ways that you're working, or or yeah, yeah. would love to hear your um, thoughts. So this, you know, full disclosure, uh, I don't work for any of the big companies, the Facebooks, the Microsoft, I do contract work, so I'm not, you know, 100% affiliated with any of them. Um, and it's not something that gets into my sort of day to day so much, but I will say that uh, as the hardware manufacturer, they, they have to kind of add these new features, which are things that people are a little bit concerned about things like eye tracking and, you know, the space tracking. Um, but I can say that at least from the Microsoft perspective that I saw, it wasn't something that, um, you know, that was uh, kind of like a high priority target to gather all this data to use to, for advertising and things like that. It was more mm -hmm. for um, make the product better, make the hardware better. So while certain things were being collected, it's kind of like the Windows 10, you know, like opt in, opt out. Do you want to send us a sort of like, um, your usage data, things like that. This this kind of thing, you know, is being collected. Um, but as far as I know, none of these things were being sort of used for, you know, the money gaming and things like that. So when when I was sort of part of the project, uh, it, it didn't it didn't really enter my sphere. You know, I wasn't mm -hmm. I wasn't you know they weren't telling me that these things needed to be done or anything like that. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know how much I actually have to add to that conversation. Um, it wasn't really part of my kind of um, yeah. uh, sphere. But I can yeah. say that using a Facebook headset, I definitely am sort of cognizant to the, to the, to the concerns and I feel them too, especially once we start adding things like eye tracking, I, you know, then these companies could not only see where my head is looking, but where my eyes are looking, um, which mm -hmm. is another sort of ammunition towards you know the the, the the ad concerns and things like that so i definitely feel it um 
Yeah, there's a different feeling of like some sort of threshold after they announce it. Well, with the elimination of the Oculus name moving to like Facebook Connect yeah. and sort of like daring that and like the requirement for the Facebook account and, and those yeah. things like that, where it definitely feels like we've moved on from like a novel display technology, even though like to interact with a lot of these platforms, um, we were you know, signing up for accounts and things like that. Uh, but we've crossed over to like here, we're within a specific like corporate ecosystem in which we are, you know, uh, uh, a user. Beth, I wanted to give you an opportunity. I didn't, uh, didn't mean to stomp on your uh, response to that too. Not at all. I mean, it's like, how do you fight the, the many headed Hydra? Like it's, um, the thing that as a as a theater maker that the, the the oculus and like and like how many of you are wearing them now the thing that the oculus was like this great hopeful piece of technology that finally all our poor theater makers were going to be able to start to engage with these incredible things that i was seeing and that colleagues were making and 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 knowing that it's always been a Facebook product, like it, it's always had that that um, coating to it. Um, and mm -hmm. now it's really troubling. Um, and so like, I don't know, is it that we make subversive work with it until they shut down all our Oculuses? Like, I, I don't know, it's, really, it's troubling. And it's certainly like, you know, it's been identified by, people like Jaron Laney for years, right, how problematic social media is, and it represents, you know, the, the destruction of what the hope for VR has always been. Um, but maybe, like, and this is why this conference and other conferences similar to it is really uh, encouraging, because maybe there's a way we find to break the system from within a little bit or, or subvert it or, um, or, or make art despite um, uh, these things. And, and, and um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. And we need regulation, right? Like that's what it comes down to. These monsters need to be regulated so that yeah. they don't devour all of our eye tracking. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, and there now I won't receive any funding from Oculus. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's been recorded. Well, it's been recorded on my headset. So right. like and, uh, Mine... obviously, if you think your phone's tracking your headset, like come on, uh, you, you gotta believe that it is. But it's um, true. There's, um, yeah. The uh, 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 Anderson Pre who is part of toaster lab and uh i'm not sure if he's in the room right now but i know he was in your uh workshop earlier so he's been in and out through the day he, he um we've been talking a lot about this recently and um before he came over to 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 spend uh, a lot more well he did his phd and has been doing much more art uh, like art focused projects he spent many years at uh, ibm um doing design research and they put a lot of money into developing things in second life and so we've been having this conversation around like what was the flexibility of that world versus this world like what are the like there's an infamous incident of an, uh, a second life uh, event where people would just like have uh, uh flying penises uh come and like <laughs> like the zoom bomb in virtual space and that's not something that's possible in in this platform as free as we are where we're sort of still limited to to the tools that are given to us um i want to open it up to the audience for uh um, conversation and i know that we could continue to talk about this but um you know especially people who you know you've been uh, in this space and maybe thinking about these things and they've been weighing on you for the last uh, uh week uh in the three days that we've been together are there questions from the audience and sort of considering any of these ideas uh, of space and how we start to work with space uh, um, in these in these different types of virtual environments. I can also add another shark to the room if you'd like me to. <laughs> but no float, but More no shark. floating penises. But <laughs> no, that's not. I mean, I guess we could break into Unity and uh, not break into Unity. <laughs> but we could go over to Unity and design one and put it into a kit and I can upload it. Like it's not impossible, but it seems like we don't. It's have a lot of work. I feel that. like there's a better use of time. Yeah, the shark <laughs> I can just pull out of a, a, an available kit. Um, okay, so I'm going to pull open 
Uh, oh. All right. So now I've turned on hand raises. If you look in your lower right-hand corner, aside from the hand raise emoji that you have, this is a different thing. The lower right. Ah, yes. I'm going to turn on uh, uh, for a two-spirit trickster here. You're on the air. You're on air. Oh, and you should amazing. Be on the air. Oh, there she is. There Hi. you go. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, Hi. I wanted to ask, um, as people who've worked in the gaming industry and in this industry in general for a longer period of time, um, what your thoughts are in relation to, uh, I guess, like the girl gaming universe, as well as uh, anything that engages in uh, eroticism in general. Like, uh, I've been chatting about uh, stuff like dating sims and the way that they're not necessarily mm. respected, uh, despite that being a huge uh, industry that has its own economy and brings in a lot of money. So do you think they would understand that language in general, um, as well as like what it's like to create uh, work and find audience and space to present work that is more queer, more inclusive, uh, or more sexually liberated? That's an awesome question. I if I may, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, I think uh, the more that we kind of like uh, mature this medium, the more we're going to start seeing uh, much more representation. But I think the the kind of for me at least, um, I think we've seen a lot of kind of like accessibility options for people that maybe don't want to, you know, be exposed to so many people like the bubble, you, you know. Um, the fact that you can make your avatar however you see yourself, I think, is a really sort of, uh, is a kind of maybe liberating experience for a lot of people. Um, and, I, you know, as I said before, I think as we mature, we're going to start seeing way more rep representation as people sort of understand the medium and can kind of, like, build for it. Because, you know, a lot of people uh, are making games still in two dimensions on a, on a computer screen for people to only consume in that one way. Um, so, as things just take time, I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of that. And I think it was just this weekend, I was on Steam and I was just looking and I found, uh, like I'm a big fan of visual novels, um, a lot of Japanese visual novels I play in you know, 2D. I saw a 3D version, like in VR, where I could actually fully experience that, um, that experience, you know, I could, I could have that experience in full 3D, which I thought was really cool. And that's the first time I've ever seen that personally, so I thought that was you know, really interesting. Yeah. I might, uh, I might ask you to respond next because uh, the th one of the thoughts that occurs to me is like the, the, and this relates also to what Frank was just saying in Pandora X, like the idea of avatar as costume and the flexibility there and sort of the relationship there and talking a little bit about that, that process, it doesn't quite, get quite uh, as far there as we would, uh, we would like, but there was a lot of social, there's a lot of like social contract building around the way that character design, especially as it was animated by a live performer as opposed to an NPC worked in that space. Um, that it seems like there might be a lot of flex, still be a lot of flexibility on a platform, like a social platform like this, or even more so on VR chat where you guys were creating that. Yeah, and I think that, um, and so, so Finding Pandora X was a live VR theater piece that happened at the Venice Film Festival um, that had three live performers uh, and then a whole bunch of other uh, performer managers and then the audience also inhabited an avatar, which became a really interesting piece because we the that was the chorus and so everybody was made the same um and was kept pretty gender neutral um was and was kept um i mean we were we were a little bit spooky we were there were it was really evocative of a feeling um and then there was playing with those <laughs> With the visions, the, and it's interesting because I'm reading my son from the Greek myths right now, and all of the 
the iterations of all of the gods are white, blue-eyed, blonde-haired. Um, whereas in Pandora, we've really played with that and worked with the avatar designer and sort of Hera was pink and Zeus was blue and and started to really um, dig into what what else is possible like because you don't have to be the blonde blue-eyed white version of these characters and and it and then the ability to shift um, midstream too to the ability to inhabit these other embodiments of character becomes a really, really compelling place to start to create from and open up mm -hmm. things like like different modes of expression and different ideas of sexuality and um, in, in real time. Like it's it's super fascinating. And I do think, I agree with Frank, I think the more we adopt this and the more we expose people to working with these tools, the more stories we will begin to see, the more modes of expression we will begin to see that explode those previous notions. Like, um, you know, I, I, I've said it a bunch of times, like the, VR liberates us from the physics of of the carbon world. Um, it also then liberates us from the the worldviews that we hold and allows us to actually go inside, like you did in that novel. Like that's extraordinary, um, and to go inside and to 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 find those places. So I do think yes, it will it will increase, um, and yeah. and as we keep playing, yeah. Yeah, I think there was uh, having uh, getting a chance to see Pandora X. I also think about sort of some of the examples of, of different ways of thinking about space that David that you brought up, because uh, there were times at which like characters to change, like uh, to change like just their presence like took up different amounts of space. They changed scale. We as a chorus changed scale, and that allowing people like. Even those simple things allow us to like sort of dissociate from like we are we are fixed in one form. We can also tell story through the, those changes that we can control from one character to another, re-manifesting into another avatar and making the dramaturgical connections there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I find I, I find there's a there's an interesting. I find myself thinking about how we tend to imagine aliens in science fiction and how much mm -hmm. of a failure of imagination that usually is. And when I think about the same thing in terms of our inventing of our, uh, our avatars, I have the most banal and boring avatar possible because there was not an, an interesting enough range for me to actually want mm -hmm. to pursue uh, further. Um, uh, and yet the possibilities are enormous. But what we run into is the same thing we run into in terms of designing space. To the degree mm -hmm. that we have a familiar space, we can leverage all our existing social behaviors. To the, degree, to the degree that our avatars conform to a certain set of expectations, we can code them in very explicit ways, uh, encode ourselves to, 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 to speak in the language of the normal space. And so there's this always this tension between how much do I want to take on all the freedom that's available here to do, to be anything, and what do I lose in terms of any sort of presence in other people's imagination if I do that. And I, I don't mm -hmm. know how we negotiate that. It's a, it's, it, it, that thing which exists in the real world doesn't disappear here. <laughs> Just the, mm -hmm. the nature of the constraints is different, right? And so, um, you know, this is, a, this is a, a fairly boring, interesting gathering in terms of the visual presentation of it, although people have put some admirable attention into making their avatars a lot more interesting than mine, and I <laughs> applaud those, but this is, <laughs> this is really middle-of-the-road uh, reality that we're experiencing here. And, yeah. um, and, and we do that for a reason, and, and I wonder how we can find new ways of negotiating the space between the familiar communicative space that we already understand the rules of and being able to jump out of that space completely at times like how, i don't know there must be a way because there's a whole space of potential locked up in the fact that we're still figuring that out yeah it's um, really i know that i spent oh sorry go ahead 
Oh, no, I was just going to say, I know we're getting close to time, but it, it's really interesting. Um, in one of the other metaverses that I that I go into, it's a place called Neos, and in Neos, there's a lot of really like heavy gamers, um, and they just build worlds, and it's it's an incredible place, and nobody nobody has uh, an embodied avatar like this. Mm. There are lizards. My 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 closest mm. friend in Neos is a piece of toast with jam, and that's how <laughs> he's known to everyone. Medra is a piece of toast with jam. And uh, nobody is is humanoid in any way, and some people are particles, and it's in, it's such an incredible way to engage with it. It feels like being in Star Trek, right? Like Next Generation managed to get beyond the humanoid alien sometimes, and so like there is a giant ball of jelly that changes shape, and uh, and that's who we get to talk with, and that's it's awesome. It's so great. <laughs> Um, yeah, and there's it's a really... lot of early, a lot of early Star Trek that my my mother referred to as just everybody had a different skin condition, and then <laughs> <laughs> some character design came into it. It was like let's let's get beyond this. Um, we, there is a question that has been posed. I'm going to invite that to have it in a post uh, session conversation because we're at time. I apologize for that. This has been really a great conversation. I will admit, uh, I will admit that I spent the first month. Of being in alt space, uh, very much a uh, a typically huge person. You would have been able to easily <laughs> identify me in alt space as a person that you would have met. And then at some point, I'm like, uh, there's no reason for me not to be blue. And I was like, well, you won't be able to tell I have fingernails unless I make them orange. So uh, it became more of a design question uh, and moving on there. So um, uh, thank you. All. I want to move it into a conversation. I think that they gave us a, like like. Think about all the limitations as we move into the last day of, uh, mm. of this convening. Um, and we're thinking about the opportunities that you have for here as we've introduced a lot of people to this platform who think about space in this way. Like, also, be, please be thinking about how you can break it, um, both mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a, a virtualization of physical space and as a corporate space um, and as like an embodied space. Ha 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 ha!